Founded in 96, Valve Software is known to have released 27 games, a number that's actually being quite nice to Valve, as that 27 actually includes games like The Lab and Ricochet. Well, then why is it that my friend JC and I were able to find examples of 30 first party canceled Valve games? First party meaning games that weren't made in other offices, such as The Crossing or the Ravenholm expansion. Let's go over 30 canceled Valve games right now. Here we go. <laughs> This video is sponsored by Frag Pro Shooter, one of the best shooting games of 2020 designed for mobile devices. With almost 50 million total players and around 1 million playing Frag every day, you have specific rewards available to you thanks to the link in the description to join. To win, you have to build your dream team and destroy the enemy tower. During the game, you control one character and the other four are controlled by bots. You can switch whenever you want. You also have third person and first person options. Free rewards are available to you only thanks to the link in the description, even for those who have already installed Frag. This was Valve's very first game concept, and very little is known about it. According to Gabe Newell, quote, the submarine game would have required us to do our own engine from scratch. It was a science fiction submarine game. It really wasn't like a World War II submarine game you'd expect. The stealthiness of it, we weren't really interested in exploring that, but we were doing it in a future context. The idea was eventually halted completely. We didn't really get far enough along to know what was possible and what wasn't. When we went down to visit id in Mesquite, Texas, and Carmack handed us the CD and was like, oh, this is the source code to Quake, we were like, okay, we're not doing the submarine game anymore. Prospero was Valve's legitimate flagship title when first starting development on the Quake engine. Half-Life was only really a concept, then called Quiver. In fact, Half-Life's writer Mark Laidlaw was only hired to work on Prospero and did the story of Half-Life as a side gig for only a few weeks. According to Mark Laidlaw in an interview with Game of Sutra back in August of 2003, quote, the basic concept of Half-Life germinated in story discussions at Valve, which happened before my arrival. When I joined Valve, in July of 97, I was supposed to do a couple weeks of work to consolidate that storyline for Half-Life so it could ship that year, while the bulk of my time was devoted to a science fantasy epic called Prospero. Half-Life proved to be an irresistible force. The Prospero team was soon absorbed and my full attention went into shaping the Half-Life story and finding ways of expressing and clarifying it in the game that was well underway. Prospero was a science fantasy MMO with a focus on user-generated content, social interaction, and a mixture of official stories and the stories of the community. These stories would be housed in pocket universes and would each contain their own servers and games. The majority of these social concepts would later be recycled into the Half-Life series, Steam, and Portal 2's PTI update, although some people from the original team still show an interest in revisiting the concepts. Valve's first iteration of Team Fortress 2 started in late 97 when the Quake Team Fortress team was hired to work directly for Valve. The basic structure was very similar to that of Quake Team Fortress, with the ideas of realism and complex team structures eventually taking shape in later iterations. This version of the game was originally shown at E3 1998 alongside Half-Life. A slightly different iteration with different art assets was promoted after Half-Life's release. However, all of this work was later shown to focus on another version. Valve then quickly shipped Team Fortress Classic to satiate the hunger of the Team Fortress fans. With the release of Deathmatch Classic, itself a love letter to the Quake Deathmatch multiplayer that inspired Half-Life's Deathmatch in itself, Half-Life 3-Wave was a port of the popular 3-Wave Capture the Flag game mode brought into the Gold Source engine. Modeled off of Zoid's own original 3-Wave CTF mod for Quake, this game mode was leaked in 2003 alongside the Half-Life 2 source code, which went undiscovered until 2016. 
Microsoft approached Valve in 2001, requesting exclusives to be developed for their then-unreleased Xbox game console. Gabe Newell, never to pass up some new interesting technology, agreed, and originally hired a bunch of ex-Sega developers to work on a game called Tebo and Kai. We'll talk about that in another video, but Gabe Newell reportedly fired that entire team in 2003 and just said, quote, let's make Team Fortress 2 for the Xbox. Nothing else is truly known about the project other than, in 2003, Valve had already moved on to Team Fortress 2 Invasion. A completely different take on the Team Fortress formula, this was focused on realistic modern military tactics and battles. The classes were far more fluid than the nine original seam in both Team Fortress Classic and Quake Team Fortress. Both teams would have been led by a commander class. It would have been a combination of a story-driven campaign and multiplayer battles, with each campaign taking place over many maps of the same theme, dynamically switching based on which team wins. Think about Hydro, but over many maps. Usable artillery and military vehicles were scattered throughout the maps, and the game was reportedly close to completion. Many Many, many people have played it in the late 90s, although the game was never seen following. As soon as Min Lee was hired to Valve in 1999 from the original Counter-Strike mod team, he started work on the follow-up to CS, initially titled Counter-Strike 2. Developed at the same time as Half-Life 2 and using the same in-development source engine, Counter-Strike 2 would expand on the scope of terrorists versus CTs, adding many objectives to each game, drivable vehicles, and much more. It was cancelled in 2009 as Min was effectively pushed out of the company for massive feature creep on the project. Although, concepts of the project were later recycled into another third-party source engine title called Tactical Intervention. This was the last unreleased version of Team Fortress 2. After the modern military aesthetic was abandoned sometime in the early 2000s, it was first conceptualized as a Romans versus aliens battle, then moving to an entirely sci-fi theme with aliens versus futuristic humans, hence the title Invasion. The game took the original design concepts of Brotherhood of Arms and expanded it greatly with the power of the Source Engine, allowing players to ride striders, gather resources, pilot drones, all while still including the Commander class. The game was put on hold in 2003 to focus on finishing Half-Life 2. In 2005, when they returned to the game after a holiday break, the team found themselves bored of the concept, even though the game was reportedly nearing completion and very good. The team eventually said, screw it, let's just remake Team Fortress Classic, and thus, the modern Team Fortress 2 was born. The entire mechanical design of Invasion was later released as a fan-made mod called Nuclear Dawn, which is actually available to be purchased on Steam right now. The source code of Invasion was leaked in 2003, and a slightly more up-to-date version was leaked in 2012. The original 2003 leak also included two models of the early Demoman type class called the Commando. Before Chet Falasek had visited Turtle Rock in 2005 and saw what they were working on with a game called Terror Strike, Valve was working on a game called the Fairy RPG. Very little is known about what this game was going to be, other than when Valve eventually purchased the rights for what became Left 4 Dead, they completely abandoned this game. And the only references we've seen from it in an interview with Gabe Newell are very humorous, as if Valve almost is embarrassed by the idea. The first version of what would eventually become, and be cancelled as, Half-Life 3 is Episode 3. Episode 3 is obvious in its design mechanics, and it saw the player using an expanded arsenal of weapons, including something called the Weaponizer, itself evolving over time to become a feature in a later Half-Life 3 iteration. The Blobulator technology was also brought in and refined here, later reused as the gels seen in Portal 2. According to the final hours of Portal 2, quote, coming off the tremendous success of Portal, Kim Swift and her team were inspired to run a more practical experiment and see where Portal technology might go in the future. Though no one was saying it, the Swift team design experiment had Portal 2 written all over it. The concept was to add a new dimension to portals. Imagine, for instance, playing a portal level where, the first time through, you fire portals to push a box off a ledge. Normally, that box would fall into a pit of lava, but with the addition of time, you could record yourself doing that first action, and then the second time through, you might fling yourself across the lava at the exact right second to catch the box. 
Swift and her team thought they had cracked the code of what could potentially become Portal 2. Gabe Newell was optimistic and, going from the event, thought this was the experiment to most likely become a full game. But after the demo, he realized it wasn't going to work. Swift, who left Valve in 2009 to lead a new development team at Airtight Games, still thinks the concept could work." End quote. After Half-Life 2 Episode 2's release, Valve conducted the science fair to determine what game they would focus on next. One of the many experiments was the Modular AI, or Margarita Soldiers Project. This experiment consisted of combined soldiers who would use upgrade chips and pick up upgrades from fallen comrades. The player could also pick up the same upgrade chips. The FGD for this project actually leaked in the 2012 Source Filmmaker beta. However, not much else is known. The original version of Portal 2, where Valve envisioned the Portal series as an episodic, serialized, first-person puzzle adventure with Aperture Science as a backdrop, this game would have used a magic camera that could copy and paste and scale objects in the world to solve puzzles. Much beloved internally, but cancelled in favor of a true Portal 2 due to playtester feedback. Stars of Blood was an FPS MMO RPG created in-house at Valve from 2007 to 2009. It was cancelled after Gabe Newell saw the massive feature creep taking place on the team. Not much is known about the story or gameplay, but the player was to travel between planets and complete quests with other players. This was rumored to be connected to the Half-Life universe, with references to the Combine all over it. The first true Half-Life 3 variation was just a continuation of what would have been Episode 3, however with a significantly expanded scope. However, it was cancelled almost immediately due to the stagnant nature of the story, gameplay, and setting. It was exactly what you would expect out of a Half-Life 3, which was not what Valve wanted to do with it. The first iteration of Valve's much-rumored FPS RPG, this took place in an unnamed fantasy setting that would later be incorporated into the Dota 2 lore. This game never got past the pre-production phase, and very little was created. Drew Wolf created art and characters that were later brought into Dota 2, Artifact, and Underlords, which after leaving Valve, he published on his portfolio website. This was a full CSGO style to update to Day of Defeat that saw the player battling in more detailed environments with a larger arsenal at their disposal. This was to be an update to Day of Defeat Source that later led into this game, itself also cancelled. This game was shown to those interviewing at Valve between the years of 2012 and 2015 and was reportedly running on the original 2011 build of CSGO as a base. It was never truly intended to be a full release, as it was more of an internal pet project by a few of the Team Fortress 2 and Counter-Strike Global Offensive developers. Developers. The game was shelved around the time Half-Life Alex started legitimate development. The second, far more complete iteration of Valve's FPS RPG project, it had gone through two known phases. The original from 2012 and 2013 was leaked in 2017. It was later greatly expanded upon and ported to Source 2 in 2015. It was intended to be a Fallout 4-esque experience with weapon crafting and resource types. This project was not VR. The concept of resource gathering and upgrades were later merged with Project Shooter and Left 4 Dead VR to become Half-Life Alex's resin upgrade system. Fun fact about Half like resource gathering, this was the first known Half-Life project to have the player be Alex Vance. The final version of Half-Life 3 was made before VR was decided to be the future of the series. This game saw Gordon Freeman escaping Aperture Science 20 years after the events of Episode 2, and later finding himself in North America in a dark cityscape with very little resistance still fighting. Gordon and the remaining rebels attempt to escape the city to reclaim a cremator factory to manufacture an army to rid the Combine from the city. It contained a thermodynamic simulation using the Rubicon, manipulated by an Aperture Science robotic arm attached to Gordon, allowing him to control the elements like water, earth, fire, air, and ice. According to design director David Speyer, quote, the game would find a building, seal up all the windows so there was only one way in, put a citizen or prisoner somewhere in the building, and then populate the building with enemies. You, as the player, would have to find a way to get into the building and locate the prisoner. The route was naturally different every time. Conceptually, these procedurally generated skirmishes would fit between the more crafted story elements that players had grown to love in traditional Half-Life games. 
In 2013, a team of nearly 30 developers dreamed of an open world Left 4 Dead 3. The game, with a story set in Morocco, would have featured many hundreds of zombies, but it wasn't long until the team discovered that the Source 2 engine was nowhere near ready to complete such an ambitious project. Quote, within every other playtest, pieces of your base would go missing and zombies would float in, end quote. We took Left 4 Dead and we hacked it apart and took the director out of it and we were using a wand and we were dropping, letting one person sit on the couch while someone else played on the TV. And the person on the couch um, sitting next to him was dropping health packs and zombies into the map while their friend played on the TV. It was insanely fun. And uh, it's like, yeah, this is the future right here. Originally conceived as a feature-length Team Fortress 2 movie, Valve was approached by Adult Swim to create a Team Fortress 2 animated series, a 12-episode miniseries. It was written and storyboarded, and the first episode, being the pilot, took way too long for Valve to finish, and Adult Swim pulled the plug. This pilot was later released alongside the Love and War update as expiration date. However, the rest of the episodes were later incorporated into the stories of the Team Fortress 2 comics, the final issue of which, Team Fortress 2 Comic 7, is likely cancelled. According to the final hours of Half-Life Alex, quote, Mark Laidlaw wanted to build a VR game, codenamed Borealis, set on the bridge of the Aperture Science Research Vessel, mentioned in Half-Life 2 Episode 2. The players would explore the tugboat as it ricocheted in time back and forth between the Seven Hours War, the conflict between the Combine and the citizens of Earth, and the time set shortly between the events of Episode 2 and Half-Life 3. There was even talk of a fun VR minigame where players would fish off the bow of the ship. Ultimately, Borealis never gained much momentum internally, and ended up in the pile of shutdown valve prototypes. Quote, in part due to the uncertainty around Source 2, another team at Valve started work on a project with its own proprietary technology based. This was a fun, light-hearted game in a similar vein to the Portal series. It transported players to the manipulatable world with a full construction and deconstruction abilities not unlike Minecraft. An early demo featured a talking character named King Kevin. Players helped the King break out of prison using their abilities, such as tearing down walls, building bridges, and shrinking animals and objects to impact the world in real time. This game was developed from October 2013 to August of 2017, and was restarted development in between that time to be a VR game. Although this voxel-based game engine was stated to be proprietary, it was later confirmed to only be an extension of the Source 2 engine itself. SimTrek was Valve's sci-fi flight simulator for virtual reality, itself leaking a little bit in the 2015-2016 Steam VR Performance Testbench demo. This game was helmed by the developers behind the Kerbal Space Program, themselves being hired at Valve around the time of the game's development. Unfortunately, the majority of the people that were originally hired from the Kerbal Space Program team have left Valve, and they took the SimTrek project along with them. The precursor to Half-Life Alex's level design, with some of their own level design work being used and later seen in Half-Life Alex, this was a single-player adventure through the world of Left 4 Dead, rumored to take place at the CETA HQ. Very little else is known, but this project was in development following the cancellation of Left 4 Dead 3 between October 2015 and February of 2016. Alien Swarm VR. According to an industry insider, quote, something was mentioned about an Alien Swarm VR experiment. Said experiment was described as a half pancake, half VR top-down game where the VR player was the one acting as a director for the non-VR players, spawning in aliens for them to fight. This apparently was an early experiment and likely didn't get very far. In late 2016, Valve was approached by Nintendo to develop a title for the then-unreleased Nintendo Switch. The project the team came up with initially was called Half-Life Tactics, codenamed HLNX. It was a real-time strategy game set during the Seven Hours War, where the player could control rebels fighting against the Combine. However, it was cancelled shortly after. There are many versions of Portal VR. I've actually heard of seven different individual versions, with many different iterations of the gameplay mechanics to make it more comfortable for VR, such as a first-person camera, a third-person camera, no portals, two-dimensional, f-stop, but none of it ended up working. 
Campo Santo, the developers of Firewatch, was hired at Valve shortly after the announcement of In the Valley of Gods at the Game Awards in 2017. This game, however, was shelved in favor of Half-Life Alex soon after the team had fully integrated at Valve, and is very likely to not come back. This was rumored to be a puzzle-slash-walking sim, and was shelved officially on July 1st of 2019. How many games did we miss? Are there any games that you know about that we probably don't? My email is down in the description below if you want to talk about any of these cancelled games. And if you want to follow up on any of the information I cover in real time, check out my Twitter page, link down in the description below. If you want to support these reports, get your name in the credits and watch them early, check out my Patreon page also down below, or maybe get yourself some merch. We're selling these ugly Christmas sweaters and t-shirts and long sleeve shirts as well, as well as missing textured socks until January 1st. Even if you like them a little bit, they are going to be going away forever in just a very short amount of time. This video was written in collaboration with my buddy JC. Check out JC's YouTube channel down in the description below, where she's going to be releasing a report on the Tau camp from the Half-Life series. And thank you very much for watching. I'm Tyler McVicker. This is Valve News Network. Have a good day. Adios.